I'm Mary Gonzalez, and uh, I want to tell you just a bit about myself before I get into the work. I'm a community organizer. I'm one of those people that uh, Sarah Palin said didn't have any responsibilities. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I am a community organizer. I've been doing this since uh, uh, the beginning of time. Um, I entered this work as a very young person back in the early 70s as a leader, served as a leader in Chicago for about eight years, then entered professionally with my husband uh, in 1980. Um, and I want to say a couple of things to you before I really get started. I mean, we did build a network of organizations, and I'll talk about that. But there are those in the country that say that power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And the people who say that are those in power who want to make sure we stay out. Corruption is acceptable in America. It is. I heard earlier that it's no longer acceptable. I saw some of you applaud gently. It is acceptable in America, and it's getting worse. All right. And the reason that there is no debate about the environment from neither the Republicans or the Democrats is because the power of those violating the environment is so incredible that neither one of the parties dare touch it. So that's what we're up against, all right? So first, let's face that. I think secondly, the people that are missing in the environmental movement, I mean, look at yourselves. You are not a reflection of the Bay Area. You are not a reflection of the world. You're not a reflection of this country. The other day, I was in a conference at the National Hispanic University, and I was told that 50,000 young Latinos turn 18 every month in America. Every month. Will they vote? Will they engage in this campaign? Will they care about what's happening to communities? That's a question I think that's got to be thought about. And that's not even talking about uh, African Americans, not talking about the Asian community, not talking about refugees, all kinds of people that are entering this country that are living here, and we're not engaging them. There's a, a guy that I love to quote, and I brought my little, you know, some of us now, I mean, at least I do, now have one of these smartphones. Uh, I'm not smart enough yet about it, but I wanted to lift up a quote that I love. And I think this is a quote that maybe you'll understand uh, why I read it to you uh, as I begin my talk. It's from a very famous guy that I love to quote, uh, Frederick Douglass, an orator and a abolitionist in our history, and he said, and, and this is about us, okay, this is about us. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet depreciate agitation are people who want crops without plowing the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the roar of its many waters. The struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one or it may be both, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. All right, so I begin my talk with that, that that's who we are. We're demanding justice without having to risk anything. So who we are? We are the Gamaliel Foundation. We are a network of some 50 organizations across America and in uh, four provinces of South Africa and three regions of Great Britain. What do we build? We build organizations. What are the purpose of the organization? Build power. That's very complicated to people. They say, well, yeah, but what are we going to do? I say, you're going to build power. I know that, but then what are we going to do? Any damn thing you want. <laughs> right? So we built power, and we're a network of organizations, and the reason we have to build organizations is people need a vehicle through which to, uh, to, to act. We live in a society that promotes individualism. Be an individual, don't connect to anything. Congregations are dying, unions are dying, bowling leagues are gone, social clubs are gone, everything is gone because we live in a society that says marry your computer, marry your smartphone, marry your email, and everything will be great because you'll be able to connect to everyone. All right, so we have to build a vehicle. 
That vehicle needs resources so that people can begin to behave like they're intended to behave. And so we promote three things. Number one, don't be an individual, live in a community. This is hard because you gotta live among poor people, among wealthy people, among immigrants, among black people, among brown people, among people who don't speak your language, among people who don't pray like you do, among people who don't eat what you do. But that's the challenge. So we have to live in community. That's number one in an organization. Number two, we have to believe in abundance and not scarcity. All right, that the world has plenty for all, but we're being taught that we better protect our own because the, our neighbor's gonna steal it from us. And so that's why we can't be in relationship. We put alarms on everything and we make sure that we are closed in a little box. So how do we break out of that? And last of all, stop being powerless. God did not intend us to be powerless. He intended us to be powerful. So start seeking power in the public arena and the way you do it is you give up living a private life and living an innocent life and living a Disneyland life and live in reality, understand how decisions are really made and get engaged in that process. Yeah. All right. All right. So here's how we do it. We engage people to do listening campaigns. I don't mean talking campaigns. I mean listening campaigns where we listen to thousands of people for half an hour apiece and begin to understand what talents they've got, what anger they've got, what values have been violated in their lives, what they're willing to invest in, what they want to do, who they know. And we begin to pull together groups through institutions, congregations, labor unions, uh, organizations, universities, to come together to begin to say, what do we all have in common in the region? What do we all have in common? And then began a campaign around how do we attack that problem. Now one might say, well this is really great. Organizers solve issues. No. My job is to convince you that you are not the potted plant that you believe you are. <laughs> that in fact, you have capacities that you're sitting on regularly. We're all sitting on them today, right? you all got capacities you're sitting on and you're unwilling to use them because you're afraid of the responsibility it's going to take if you step up. Now, it's really nice to see all these beautiful things that I see all the time. I see them everywhere. I see these beautiful books and pictures of fish and, you know, it's really nice. <laughs> Boring as sawdust. All right, so then we got to agitate people through training. So we formally have training programs. I'm going to have the next one in Oceanside, November the 11th. It's six days of boot camp. And I bring 100 people into that boot camp, and I bring some of the finest trainers in America to come into that boot camp with me. And the objective is for them to step out of there defining what they want to do. Not what I want them to do, what they want to do. And my job is to push them to do it collectively. Thirdly, is to take people into action. Now, if you watched the presidential uh, debate the other night, here was Obama and here was Mitt Romney. Were they willing to say, hey, look, could we run the country together? Yeah. Could we unite? Of course not. They want power. They want the ultimate power. They want authority over each one of them over what's going to happen in the world. But we're always trying to figure out if we can convince these powerful entities who are destroying the environment, if we could just all work together. It isn't going to happen. The only thing power understands is an equal or greater power. So the question is, how do we build that power? There's a great book that I read a long time ago. And you've probably read it. It's called Power and Innocence, written by Rollo May. Has anyone read it? Okay, and so what's the message of, of power and innocence? Do you remember? No, but you will. I got into a very lengthy job after that. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, one of the things I got out of that book is that we seek to remain innocent. You know, we seek innocence. We buy into the culture that says be a consumer. Worry about the car you drive. Worry about the kind of computer you have. Do you have a smartphone? You're really not in if you don't have a smartphone. And so the very corporations who are destroying the environment are convincing you that the real answer is that you have the right phone. And you've bought it. You have absolutely bought it because it's easier. It puts you in no danger to risk anything. Your name, you, people say to me, I don't speak up because 
I might say something stupid. I don't speak up because I might be wrong. I'm, I don't speak up because I might wind up alone. You know, I don't speak up because I don't think there's a payoff. I've seen people speak up and they just get punished. I'm not gonna do it. So how do you convince people to speak up? Well, first of all, you gotta get them all in one room like here. Like if I, each, if I gave each one of you a pistol, right, right now, I went to my car, got out a box, gave you each a pistol and sent you out for an hour, you would have 100 people, 1,000 people in this room. Just bring them by force. <laughs> We're gonna talk about the environment today. <laughs> but uh, let me give you an example. In the Bay Area, and Carl Anthony is here, one of the greatest leaders in environment in the United States. And Dr. Paloma Pavel, his partner in, and co-founder of Breakthrough Communities with him and co-director. Now, what I, most, what I most love about Carl is he talks to me about public policies that are going to change the environment. Public policies. He talks to me about transportation. What are we going to do to get cars off the road? Well, one would say, well, how did it get so bad? Well, let's go back. And I'm just going to give you my take. You don't have to agree with it. I think way back in the Reagan era, th that famous president that did everything right, way back then, a decision was made. You know, he wasn't a big union man. He kind of opposed unions, right? Kind of. Anyway, the largest appropriations bill in America outside of war is transportation. It's also one of the greatest contributors to pollution and all kinds of negative things related to our environment. And about 50% of that money in those years, I don't have the exact numbers, was going to public transit, buses. And the other 50% was going to roads, highways, bridges, and so on. Today it's 84% to highways. 84% to highways. Because he began to move, make that move not to, so that he could punish unions. That punishment continues, you know, that's what happened. The Supreme Court said, oh, of course corporations can give billions of dollars to a politician to get their self-interest met. But now you've got Prop 30 coming up, right? That says that a, a person, an individual, you know, if he belongs to a union, none of that money can go to a politician. How disgusting. All right, so you've got 84% of all the money in transportation going to just highways. Is that a good thing for you, given who you are? I don't know, tell me. No way. All right, that's where it is. All right, so then we said in the Bay Area, Carl, Paloma, myself, and our organization said, we want all young people, who sixth grade and over, to have a free bus pass 24-7, to ride buses be for two reasons. We want kids who are low income not to have transportation be the, obje the objection to them finishing school. And number two, we want to create a new uh, generation of transit riders. Two years of battles, public meetings, confrontations, arguments, all kinds of things. Politicians pitting us against other groups who also had needs, all kinds of things. We ultimately got an appropriation. It's not anywhere near what we need, and it still has to be approved through a measure that's coming down the track in November. All right, two years. Folks are exhausted, right? Two years. For $156 million, if it had been $300 billion, I wouldn't have minded the two years. But $156 million is coffee money to the MTC. So that's what you're up against. So I just want to share that with you. So the first thing you got to do, or at least I think about with my folks, let's get out of Disneyland. And let's start understanding who those groups are that are keeping the Republicans and Democrats and start nailing them and naming the CEOs and naming the people who are making these decisions instead of just talking in, in general terms. Secondly, let's agitate an awful lot of people and let's pull in the black folks and the brown folks and the young folks. Let's bring the Asians, let's bring the Spanish speaking, let's bring the immigrants into this room because they're growing at an extremely rapid way. And if we don't address it now, it's gonna be too late.
Thank you very much.